So we're coming up on Big Boy right now. Got these two tracks go all the way back, and then that, and that's that track you see right there. Oh, okay. We're, we're actually sitting right here, and this, oh, okay. just, this is that building. And so these have been stubbed off, and so what they want to do is they want to build these six display tracks, and then this is a shed that's eventually going to be over it, and this is going to be the building that's going to look like that. Oh, so that's a building. Right, but oh, that's okay. what we're... That's what we're looking like. And right now they've got to do the grading and do the utility installation of power and right. drainage and all that stuff. And then they'll put the dirt back on and lay the road beds for these display roads. Right. And then uh, that's, that's the next step. Like I always tell everybody, this is not a museum yet, it's a rail yard. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. So it's not compliance safe with everything. You gotta watch where you're walking. Yeah. Do what? Do a little paradigm shift and think about why is all this stuff here? I mean, these things were running from the late 1800s to the 1950s. And how did people get around back then? There right. wasn't an interstate highway. There weren't Absolutely. airplanes. If you wanted to go from Dallas to Los Angeles, you hopped on a train and rode it for three days. Right. If you had a lot of money, you rode it in a compartment that had a bed that you could sleep in at night. Yeah. And you had to eat. And so... I mean, that was the first thing for me was just thinking, okay, why did they do this? And the answer is because there was no interstate highway. There was no yeah. air travel. People didn't really want to drive their car on a muddy road for two weeks to try to get there. This was the way to go. Yeah. All right. You can take them through these two cars. I'll do the caboose and, okay. and the uh, so bug. The way these things are set up, remember there's a steam locomotive at the front. Okay. Spewing out ash and all that stuff. Right. So if you're going to ride in the train, the best place to ride is at the back of the train. Right. And so that's where the highest dollar stuff was, and that's why the Pullmans were at the back. And then you go forward, and then there's the dining car, and then you go before that, there's the coach car for the low-price tickets. But this, So this is kind of the uh, okay. top-of-the-line stuff. The, o the other reason these were at the end of the train, and it works the same way on Amtrak today, is if you're a coach passenger, you can walk through the train, but you can't go through the sleeping cars. Uh, okay. Those are protected by the sleeping car attendant. So even on Amtrak today, if you get a roomette, because when you leave your room, it doesn't lock. There's no key. Right, right. You know, but your your area, the car is safe because people walking through, unless you have a sleeping car ticket, you don't go into those cars. Oh, okay. Now That's you it. can walk all the way to the front to the, through the coaches. Yeah. But in the dining cars and whatever, but you can't go through the sleeping car oh, okay. unless you're a passenger. Interesting. Yeah, side on the back door of this dining car that says no coach traffic past here. Hold on. You know, this car originally was a segmented car, you know, sleeper car. Right. It was donated to the museum from Freightmaster who took it and made it into a uh, like a rolling laboratory. Right. They, um, you'll see in the front the several of the compartments have been ripped out, a kitchen's been put in, and uh, they used it to test for stability of ride, smoothness of ride, and all that. So, Excellent. Come on in. Let's take a look at this. There's two different sizes of configuration. There's this bigger sleeping room. This one's set up with beds. That's oh, okay. the nighttime configuration. Notice they got a little bathroom over there. The this is a nighttime configuration? Yeah, you've got an upper and a lower bunk. Oh, okay. That upper bunk raises up into the ceiling, and the lower bunk converts into two benches with a table in between during the daytime. So that's nighttime sleeping configuration. And then here's the daytime. This one's not quite as luxurious because it doesn't have the bathroom separate, but see oh, okay. how the, that's the... Oh, this is the daytime? That's the daytime configuration because the, oh, okay. the benches, they fold the table goes right. away and the benches uh, push together to be a bed. And then here's the upper bed right here and it just drops Oh, down. it just drops down, okay. And the... The car was attended by porters. Right. Um, this is the nighttime configuration. The night, and okay. the porter would come back and set your bed up and, you know, 
get everything ready for sleeping at night. And the next morning, bring you coffee, newspaper, stuff like that. Okay, cool. And then this is the larger configuration with the separate bathroom. And Let me walk in here and take a look. Because that one's just had a little sink in the corner. And the fact of the matter is there is a little settee in the corner. And if you lift it up, it's actually a toilet that dropped right down. Oh, okay. As opposed to a chemical toilet like this. So this is like the one of the bigger rooms? Yeah, that's the bigger, uh, bigger suite. Oh, wow. So it's got the bathroom and the... And then you... Oh, that's good. Nice. And this is the smaller one. And step forward and look behind this door. Oh, and behind this and door? Can you open lift, it? Lift that little hassock right there. And then this smaller car. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's the other. So you're the, the in room bathroom and the. <laughs> okay, cool. Now, the whole train car was like this with these right. compartments. But then when Freightmaster took it over, at this point, they changed things. They ripped them out, converted this one into a kitchen. Okay. Oh, okay. They converted it. Yeah, because this was, this was just compartments all the way up. And they converted that one into a kitchen and then they ripped these compartments completely out and this was their rolling lab. And you can kind of see this was what the car looked like before we repainted it in the Pullman colors. Oh, okay. And then this is what was in in this room. Oh, okay. There, here's the lab right cool. now. Where this is that wall. Oh, okay. And so you can kind of see how it was. Oh, so that, this was that wall right there. Yeah, this, okay. this was that wall. And this people, was that wall, but mm -hmm. okay. And this was the lab. Yeah. Now, one of the things about, I mean, this is back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, the porters were African-American men, and that was a really good job. I mean, it was yeah. very much a segregated job. It was, there weren't any people other than African-American men that did this. Cool. And it's a uh, it pretty first-rate job from what I can gather for, for folks at that time. I, Grew up in Alabama in the 50s and understand all of the horrible things about segregation that I saw as I was growing up. And this looked like a great opportunity for people to get out of that. Because I'm in here, 1925. You know, wow, 1925. That's, that's pretty remarkable progress. Yeah. These guys would run the car, you know, make down the beds and bring the coffee and all that. Wow, now, that's great. Of course, you want to have breakfast when you get up. Yeah. That's in the next breakfast part. is this way. Breakfast is. Oh, hey, John, before I put these uh, in my pocket good, <laughs> and drive away and leave you here. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it doesn't stay open. What do we call this one? This car? This, this just a dining, a dining car? dining car. And this one's got kind of an interesting history. There was a gentleman that was an early benefactor of the museum. And uh, he bought this car at a scrapyard by outbidding a scrap dealer by 100 bucks. Bought it for $1,500. $1,500 for the whole car? Uh -huh, and donated it to the museum. And then they spent $65,000 getting it put back in this kind of shape. But this is the way it was laid out. And uh, it's laid look, out just like that. Yeah. If you look back at the door, there's the little sign that says coach passengers can't go past that door. This, mm -hmm. We've described this as kind of like the curtain between the front first class and tourist class in an airplane. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, all the people up front were coach class, and they would line up down there beside the kitchen. Uh, people in the sleeping class had priorities. They could come here first. Here's kind of an interesting little deal here. This is the menu. Oh, you got the menu? The Put it on this table and let's take a look at it. There it is. <laughs> That's a menu. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's see if we can. I don't know if I can. No, it's okay. Get you some more light on it. Is it MKT, KD lines? Yeah, the MKT is. Um, wow. You know the Katy Trail in Dallas? Yeah. Well, that's. The rail, that Katy Trail is on the rail bed of the Katy Railroad. 25 cents? Yeah. <laughs> the prices have definitely uh, They've gone up a little bit. They could seat 34 people at a time. You'd usually have a steward right. and a couple of waiters, and then you'd have a cook 
if you look forward on the left side, that's the kitchen. You can go on up there and take a look at it. So we're going into the kitchen. Okay. Well, you go up to it. You can't go in it, but you can go up to it. And uh, on the left is the it's a wood burning stove. And usually have. Oh, okay. So I can go up in and just go not up there to it and just look in the door. Oh, okay. Great. Wow. See what they had to cook on, and you can imagine the heat in this little hallway to your right from that stove. Yeah, it would be very warm. <laughs> yeah, but this hallway goes up to the coach class, and the coach people could come back here and eat too. So you see that it's just all around. It doesn't stay open, so okay. if you can just hold it. Hold it up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. There he is. I'll give you a hand down there. Go ahead, then we're going to hop okay. out there and go to the You're looking for snow and tracks. <laughs> there you go. That's cool that the snow hadn't melted yet. Okay, obviously you've seen the first class passenger right. services, the, the dining car, the Pullman. Um, this was obviously the derail crews on freight trains right. accommodations. This particular caboose was built in 1948, so it's relatively modern. It even has off of the front set of wheels a pulley that's turning a generator so they could charge their batteries and have electric lights right. and possibly a radio in here back then. Um, the, rail, the, the caboose was for the rail crew. Now, the locomotive and engineer may, and maybe a fireman back in the steam day, the conductor rode in here who was actually the controller of the train. Right. Every train has a conductor, whether it's freight or passenger. He might also have a brakeman or another trainman with him in this car. Their job was to look at the train from the back end. Watch the square boxes you see on the wheels. Yeah. Uh, journal boxes. Those are lubricated because that's where the wheel is actually resting. And oh yeah, the axle. friction. You get so, close, you see the the kind of cloth looking stuff. Oh okay. Well, that would soak up the oil and lubricate the bearing as it would roll. Oh wow. Okay. And if those were getting hot, they would start to smoke. The, the crew could see things like that. Right. Now, All the you know, <laughs> hot box. Right. Or they might see maybe on a flat car some load it may have shifted. So they're going to tell the engineer in, up ahead. Of course, in more modern times, they had walkie-talkies, radios. Uh, as we pointed out at the at the earlier tour, back in the pre-electronic day, they would have to get on, the, take the ladder up to the top, and walk across all the train cars to get to the engineer. Yeah. And subsequently, if the engineer wanted to stop the train, he'd use a whistle signal. They could turn the, the wheels on the caboose and on any of the freight cars to apply the brakes manually. Because everything now is air brake and automated, so you don't have that issue. Right. Um, about in the middle 80s, the the technology came up with a thing called a FRED, flashing rear end device. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're at a grade crossing and you see a train, a freight train go by, you see that little box that's on the coupler of the last right. car. That does what the crew in here used to do. Oh, it, okay. It, it senses the everything. I'm not sure how it works right. specifically, but. It's, it's wired to tell the engineer, and the conductor has now moved up into the locomotive with the engineer. There is no fireman because there's nothing to stoke. So there's the engineer and the conductor in the locomotive, and then the Fred tells them if there's any issues behind, behind them. Because obviously the engineer is always looking forward, watching right. that last car trying to beat him across the grade crossing. Mm. So you're welcome to walk through here. The only thing I ask is you don't climb the stairs, the ladder to the cupola. But this was their dormitory. So we can actually walk up in there? Walk through all the way and oh, come okay. out the other end. Oh, okay. Um, this was their office, their dormitory, their kitchen, their restroom, and, of course, their uh, observation from the top. So the whole, basically the whole crew, just this is their home. Right. It yeah. wasn't fancy, but it, it kept them out of the office. Right. So you, can, you can hop on, grab onto the railings, and walk through, and then I'll meet you at the other end as you come out from there. Great. We got the, the sound of trains in the background. Well, the BNSF main line that brought all these cars right. up here it was right over there. Here, here, here.
just in case. So this, wow, see a perspective. Cool. So it kind of opens it up, you know? Yeah, it's a, like a wide angle lens sort of thing. So we got all these, they would just like hang out and... Hang out here, there's a desk where you can tell the right. business and a stove or heat, you know, furnace. That's where they stayed warm and mm -hmm. were warm, able to cook too? Warm and cooking. Here's the bathroom right here. Oh, okay. Uh, and a water tank. Oh, okay, wow. And then the... Uh, Top law up there where they'd sit up and watch the trains. Oh, okay, so they could sit up there? Sit up there and they could see the whole thing. When the train went around the curve, they would just watch all the boxes off the journal boxes on all the cars and just see right. you know, what if anything was smoking. Oh, okay. So they had one on this side too, huh? Yeah. You'd sit on the side of whichever if you're about to go into a left hand curve. That line. was a comfortable seat, probably compared to back there, right? Or I would think so. It'd be better looked more comfortable than that, yeah. for sure. Sam, can you like shut those doors? Wow. Okay. So that I don't know if there's there's locks, but I know we can close the doors. to the elements. Right. As you can see on that last wheel, the pulleys for the generator right here. Oh, you're talking about right there, that right pull? There, right. So that's the generator right there? That would go in, yeah, and that would, as the train rode along the tracks, it would, you know, turn the, the generator to keep the batteries charged and electricity for the car. That's fantastic. That's something that would have been on a newer caboose rather than on something from the 20s or that. The next item we got here is right behind you here. We call it the doodle bug. And basically, it's a self-contained, self-powered car. It, it's not only, you know, it has an engine, but it has car. And some of these units were built, even had passenger compartments at the back. This one strictly had freight and mail capacity. These would run where there was light passenger traffic, didn't warrant them having a train with a locomotive and cars. Right. They would run this and connect one car, it would pull one car behind it. This actually ran on the Santa Fe up into the middle 60s in New Mexico, around Clovis, Carlsbad, that part of New Mexico. And they would obviously link up with a station that was serviced by a main, main line uh, passenger train. This car still runs, it is operational, uh, and the mate to it is, unfortunately we won't be able to see because of the water, is out there, it, it was a two car set, the, this and the and the observation car that ran behind it. Again, Is the observation car back out that way where you can't get to? You can't get okay. to. Okay. Uh, up until the middle 60s. Okay. Now this car is also an observation car. This is an older version than what they call yeah. the heavyweight. This actually was built in 1900 out of wood. And then about the 20s it was reshopped and, and, and put metal on it because it was... Is wood underneath it still? Yes. If you look up underneath there you can see some... You can underneath see, right up in there? Yeah, you can still see some of the original wood. Uh, up in there, right? Yeah, it should be visible up in there. And the cars really had kind of two designations. If they were for a passenger train, they were called an observation car. Right. And again, like the Pullman in the dining, this would have been the last car to train for the first class passengers. And basically, it would have been a nice lounge. Right. And lounge chairs, you know, maybe a small bar for bar service. And then at the very end, again, we can't see it. The, the last couple windows are full size so that you can watch the countryside. The old heavyweight observation cars always had pretty much the open back end, mm -hmm. the little porch railing thing. And if you've seen pictures of Truman holding up the newspaper, that type of back oh, of okay. the car. Now, if it was a private car for the railroad brass to ride in, the supervisor or superintendent of that line, it was called a business car. And it was probably configured more for the traveling executives on the line. Yeah. Maybe have one. This one actually has a couple bedroom suites, a small kitchen, and then again, the back of the car would have been like where they had their meetings. Right. And they would hook this onto one of their trains, and somewhere along the line, they would do an inspection of their lines. But basically, the cars are pretty much the same depending on what they were used for. Right. This car, unfortunately, has a lot of bad roof issues, as yeah. we're doing right here. And it's getting a lot of water damage. Now we can go pack. down there just a little ways, can't we? Well, you can get as far as the ladder, but really it's kind of 
slippery and there's a big pond of water blocking our way there. Right. I mean, this is a major, this is Lake Frisco. Right. I mean, we used to be able to walk across that, but obviously now, and you can see the way the dark earth on all the dry ground, that's where they're doing all the grading and, and, and preparing the rails for the uh, utility lines and so, then eventually so years from now you're saying that these this tracks will go we'll be, into we'll be looking at a bunch of tracks right there where that water is right right and it'll okay. all curve and go to the left all the way down the cotton okay. gin road yeah you see the blue and white the blue stripe white car yeah, so the, the silver car just to the left of it that was the mate of the doodle bug oh okay that was it originally ran in the original El Capitan between Chicago, Los Angeles. Right. When they got the high-level cars in uh -huh. the 50s, they regulated that to branch line service, and that's what right. was made it up with the uh, with the doodle bug. That blue and white stripe car is a rail postal car. You know. Where they used to sort mail, yeah, was, and we would take you to there, but again, it's it's not accessible because of the water. And sort it and throw it out at the next platform or whatever. Right. Going. Yeah. Anyway, just and the, the deal is that. Really, the post office is what kept the passenger service going for as right. as it did. So when the post office quit using rails, that pretty much was the end of passenger service. Yeah, they lost the mail contract in the middle 60s, and between 60s, like say the middle 60s and 71 when Amtrak, rail service just deteriorated greatly right. on most railroads. Santa Fe was one of the few that still ran first class trains up until the time of Amtrak. But a lot of the other railroads just quit doing passengers. These two armor cars, which are reefers, uh, before refrigeration, they used to load them with big blocks of ice on the on the roof to keep the cars cold. These were uh, assigned to the armor meatpacking plant. If you ever been to the Fort Worth stockyards, oh yeah, okay, and the big building that says armor. That's what these cool. worked out of. When they finally got rid of that 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 the processing, these cars were were sidelined and then eventually donated to the museum. So that would have been how your fresh produce and meat traveled in those and what engines in front of that that one that's the seven spot which was it spent its entire life at union station in dallas it's completely impossible to well the best way to see it is to go back out okay and drive around the other yeah if you come okay if you go on the driveway behind the discovery center you'll get a You obviously didn't weren't exposed to any danger. You you really didn't stand in the vestibules when the train was running, but they would lock, you know, lock the sides up and then put this gate. This would have been the last. Could car. people just stand out there watch? Probably, but the conductor would probably ask that oh. they came in just for safety reasons. Oh, okay. They wouldn't want anyone falling onto the train. Climb up there to they do. Would climb up there and walk car to car to car to get to the engineer if they had no other way of contacting. While them. it was like while, while it was running, yes. Oh, okay. And obviously a very dangerous job because if the train hit a bad chunk of right. track and it swayed and you went flying off, right. you were gone. Yeah. They never even knew where you were gone or you fell off. And again, you can see this little platform where you, they would sit and turn the brake wheel to turn to apply or re release the brakes. Oh, so that brake wheel right there, they're right, yeah. to release the brakes. And, and you can see it, it's chained down to this and it basically pulls it in, pulls the brakes right. on. That's cool. Of course, nowadays everything, the cars don't even have the walkways on the top. They just, they're all, everything's done uh, through the brake, the air brake line. And on a car like this tank car, they would walk on this platform along the side, right. doing the same thing. And then here we've got an older caboose. And again, you can see the platform on the roof where they would climb up the ladder, get on that roof and start walking car to car if they had to. Sometimes they just knew to, to turn the brakes because they were coming on a spot where right. they needed to stop. 
I like the air conditioning this car has, the screen door. <laughs> that was about as much air cool as they got. They'd leave the big door open and let the screen door It's just a little, uh, since it says keep off, it's probably uh, kind of rickety kind oh, of. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's not now, uh, Bob, did you point out the, Bob, point out the capacity of this type? No, not yet. Notice on the end of the car it says capacity 8,090 right. gallons. Right. But we're going to see a locomotive that's got a fuel tank that's got a capacity of 8,200 gallons. And when you realize... Wow, this locomotive's fuel tank is bigger than that tank car. Wow, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, it's kind of cool. But. Now this caboose is, goes back to the 20s, right? And it's obviously a little different because it has a, like a baggage door and windows. Uh -huh. This would have been used to haul people and light freight on a light traveled line. Right. So they might not have had passenger service. So at the end of a freight train, they would have this caboose, and there was the normal crew quarters at the end. But they could take small, you know, mayo or milk or whatever they were haul, and then people could get on here and ride to the next city that might be had passenger service. Okay. So it had like a dual function. That's cool. That's what happens when you're outside 24/7. Yeah. You know? And this is one of the older locomotives. How old is this one? Because you can see on the wheel uh, bearing AOSRR. That's Age of Steam, which was the predecessing name back in the yeah. you know 60s 70s 80s so that was an age of steam museum back in back there yeah. oh, okay right. okay yeah and this i don't know how old this was going to be yeah i'm not sure myself but it obviously needs a major scraping and paint job yeah. look at the above and the age of steam railroad yeah oh yeah yeah that's cool Locomotive that's being restored, so it's got a nice paint job. But you notice something that's missing there's no numbers, no name, right? It's all in you, know, you got the base coat on. So, as restoration takes place, it'll get renumbered and, and re identified. Uh, but in the meantime, at least it looks good as far as the paint job, yeah. So what 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 makes this one nothing like anything in the southwest? Because it runs on overhead wires, which we don't have Fantastic. on our major. It's like the dart trains. It's an all electric. Uh, this ran in the Northeast corridor, all like electric. Boston, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Washington D.C. They right. still run all electric. Even Amtrak runs electric in that part of the country. Will this facility eventually have any electric? That's probably not going to be part no, of it. Won't. Just because there's only the one. That's right. Out here, and right? Have, you know, you would have to build a tower and like the dart rail and have right. the wires and everything. You see the springs and everything, all that black stuff up there. You know how the dart train has the overhead thing that's yeah. touching the wire? That's what that, this did. That pops up and contacts the wire. Oh, okay. The, these were very great locomotives. They started in the 40s, they ran as late as the 80s in service for various railroads. This was Pennsylvania. Then when they merged with the New York Center, it was painted in Penn Central colors. Then it was painted in Amtrak colors. And when we got it, we restored it back to its original Pennsylvania livery. Right. The note with history on this, and the reason we have it, it was one of two locomotives that pulled Robert Kennedy's funeral train in 1968. Wow. Unfortunately, 4901 was not preserved and was scrapped. So we've got the only remaining locomotive. That's why it's here, because of its notoriety in history, you know. And the so fact this one it, did pull the... Yes, yeah. it pulled now, the Now, it, it used to be marked 4901, and it was scraped, is that what you're saying? Or well, like, 4901 was the other look. There were two locomotives Oh, on I the see train, what you're saying, okay. And 4901 was never preserved. Oh, I see what you're I saying. I went researching one day through all these online records, and I found right. that it was scrapped. And I'm like, oh, what a waste. Right. So, and again, it's it's the third type. We've got steam power trains, diesel electric trains, and straight electric trains. Right. So we've got a sample of all kinds of motive power. And again, it's connection to history. As I mentioned earlier, Santa Fe kept up their, their rail, their passenger service right to the right. end. This was a locomotive built around the middle 60s to replace the older units, which we'll see further down on the tour. Um, these were built to haul trains like the El Capitan, the, the, San, the, the San Francisco Chief between Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, once Amtrak took over the passenger service in 71, 
I'm sure they may have leased a few of these to Amtrak for motive power. Those that didn't get leased were put back into service just pulling freights. But it is painted in what we call the war bonnet colors, which are the red and the silver. Santa Fe's passenger engines were in this color. Their freight engines were in yellow and blue. So there's a difference. And again, this one was originally passenger, so it had the war bonnet colors. Excellent. You can see, and they were produced, if you look at the wheel frame, EMD, Electromotive Division of General Motors, who built locomotives uh, in a, outside the city of Chicago, a town called LaGrange. I lived right next to that uh, factory, and my backyard of my apartment looked over a rail yard. I would see all kinds of different road names yeah. that were being produced and then waited till they were sent off to the... Railroad that when you were growing up, them, when I was growing up, yeah. So that's how you got into all this stuff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now this train. You is... get a front shot of it. All right, go ahead about this, this train. One, and again, it's different in a couple of manners because it's blue instead of the traditional black. Right. The Meteor was a name go train ahead. that ran on the railroad, it was one of their premier trains. That's a nice looking train, that, that painting. And part of the notoriety again is this locomotive pulled part of Harry Truman's re-election train through Missouri and Arkansas. Uh, I would assume this is Big Boy. No, this no. is not Big Boy. No, it's not even Big Boy. It's no, this is the Big Fresco 4501. This is a 4501? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See the number big number there on the side of the tender. Okay. Um, now it does have big drive wheels. But not as many as the big boy, as we right. see in a little bit. Are the wheels uh, uh, the same size, but not as many? They well, like I think the... these are even a little bit bigger. Right. In, in actual height, you know, in size. Something to think about with simple gear ratios. Right. If you have low gear ratios, you have a lot of power. If you have high gear ratios, you have a lot yeah. of speed. Well, this is a passenger locomotive. Well, they get the gear ratio by the diameter of the wheel. The bigger the diameter of the wheel, the faster the locomotive will go for right. the same number of strokes on the piston. So these wheels are actually bigger than the big boy wheels because the big boy is all about power, not speed. This oh, is yeah. all about speed, not power. So this is actually, I mean, you know, I'm 6'2", and it's right up here at the top right. of my head, and the big boy wheels maybe three or four inches in diameter smaller than that, which doesn't seem like much, but it makes a lot of difference when you're... And, and people always ask, what's missing? Well. During the move, that since this was rolling on its own wheels, the drivers were taken off so that they wouldn't push that piston into a into an empty steam box. Right. Because you're going to just have metal on metal friction, and you don't want it's like driving your car without oil. It would just start to burn up. So these have been disconnected. And once the display tracks are in, and we organize this in a display, they'll put these pieces back on for realism. Oh, but good. But for the actual move. They had to be disconnected, and they're stored in some of the box cars that we had. Yeah, these were, uh, unfortunately, with the big boy when it was coming here, apparently one of the, I mean, the pistons did seize up because the big boy. This is called a piston rod, and on the big right. boy, the piston rods were whacked off. Oh, so, did? Because they cut them. So, because all this mechanism's going, that piston's going to keep doing like this, and apparently it froze up or something. But they cut the piston rod so they could continue moving. Let's don't have any remarkable history except that they're, they're filled with all kinds of material. They got all the parts off of that. <laughs> wow. Now these are one of the early diesels uh, built in the late 30s, 40s, 50s. They had the, the designation of F units, and they were like F3, F5, F7, F9. Basically, they looked the same. They were some a little longer, some a little shorter. Some had different configurations of the portholes. Right. But basically, these were your primary diesel engines in the, in the beginning of the diesel age. Again, this one is painted in Santa Fe war bonnet, so it would be an engine that pulled a, a passenger train. Oh, this, okay. You know, and they could be coupled together, so you could have... A one with a cab is called an A unit. One without a cab is called a B unit. So you could, depending on your load or where, incline, if you're going through the mountains, you could have an A, a unit or ABA. You could add a number of them, and that was the advantage of those diesels. 
you could add or subtract motive power depending on where you were going and what you were hauling. It, had, it was very versatile. The other thing about these is they're not fancy, they're not pretty like steam engines. They're a hundred times more efficient. Where a, a steam engine with, with coal or oil and then water maybe could go anywhere up to a hundred miles before it had to be refueled. These can run thousands of miles on, on, on their fuel. That's awesome. You know, because they're just more efficient. Now again, this one was built EMD, but if you notice, it says Canada on there. This was originally built for the Canadian National Railway. Oh, okay. But since they're not a, a rail people associate with us down here, and Santa Fe did use these, we just painted it in the war bonnet colors. So it's, it's, it's kind of a different original owner, but it's still the same thing that the railroad actually used. Right. This one is also operational. And oh, it good. It's the workhouse horse of the entire museum. It will move everything, including the big boy, when it needs to. Did so, it move it? Uh, yeah. The big boy did. This is the one that I saw in the video. Where it's running up yeah. and down the track, well, yes. Well, you saw it where it's running up and down the straight track at Fair right. Park. But the video where it's actually being moved out here, that's being pulled by two Burlington Northern yeah. Santa Fe BNSF locomotives. Oh, okay. And that's why you see our, our handy dandy power cord. We're keeping the batteries charged. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. You, that's why you got this view. Take a look at the back of the tender and notice the capacity of the gallons. Oh, 25,000 gallons. That's 25,000 gallons of water because a diesel, I mean, a steam locomotive has to have water and it has to have fuel. And so it had 25,000 gallons of water and I think we decided 28 tons of coal cool. that would take it for How many tons miles. of coal? 28 tons. Probably. 28 tons of coal. Take it 100 miles. And obviously because of the enormity of the, the, the fuel that it was required, there wasn't a there wasn't a right. fireman sitting there with a shovel shoveling this like right. you see on smaller. They had an auger that would just drag it into the firebox. Well, one of That's our neat. challenges for moving this from Fair Park, this weighs two a little over two million pounds, and so the two diesel locomotives that were used to pull it didn't have the braking power to stop it, and so the uh, BNSF put five tank cars in the front, five tank cars in the back, because the brakes on this don't work. But in order to connect the air brakes we had to hang this hose oh yeah all the way down the side to provide air to the back tank cars and then they drove about 10 or 15 miles an hour so this is there. the big boy huh and this is the big boy right and this air hose is because there is an airline but it was probably needed right. repair and it was just more expeditious to put this hose in once it's moved to its permanent site when we get the display tracks they'll get rid of this hose obviously yeah it's, it's got cable ties holding it on now, now if you notice the back set of wheels yeah. The first two are on a separate truck, those very first two in the front, but this rest are all one solid piece, which makes for making curves really difficult. That's when right. Running out in Wyoming and in Montana and Utah, the tracks are pretty straight. Also, if they've got all that coal and all that water in there, the weight alone will keep the, the wheels on the tracks. For the move from Fair Park, we actually had them jack up some of the wheels so that if they did skew off the rail, they didn't cause a derailment. Oh, okay. We were coming out of Fair Park going through an S-curve, a very tight S-curve. Yeah. And pulling this thing out backwards going through an S-curve, it was in trying. Matter of fact, it did jump the track a couple of times. And that's when we got the idea of jacking up and shimming up the back axle. Basically, this was the only axle that wasn't shimmed up. Oh, yeah. Uh, the problem is since we kept jacking up more axles, this one kept settling more and more because yeah. of the weight. But it made it through and made it out okay. And once we got out on a straight line, then the F7 could pull it back and forth to what we call exercise it to get, yeah. uh, lubricate the joints. Now, you notice that some of the wheels, the, the white paint is missing. Yeah. Well, these trains, when they were in real service, didn't have white walls. <laughs> That's something we do at the museum to make it look pretty yeah. and stand out. But where they couldn't reach the, the, because the wheel was in the upper part of the frame, so that's why when we rode it now, there's these blank spots yeah. where they could never reach the, the, the paint. But if you look at uh, original film of, of the big boys, or most steam locomotives, they do not have white walls on, trim on their wheels. Right. That was just something the railroads didn't mess with. It. Again, you can see that right. the wheels are a little bit low, smaller than the 4501, but you've got okay. all, you've got eight of them. So, right. you know, now. So we can stand up beside that other wheel. Yeah. And then, I don't know if I can get up that one here, but you can see the 
this one's several inches lower yeah. on me than that other one because this is designed for power, not for speed. Although it still go pretty fast. Yeah. Now, because of the length of this locomotive to do to make curves anywhere, right? It's called articulated. The steam, the, the actual boiler, is one solid piece, but the sets of wheels are on independent suspension. So as the here, think of this as the as the train, this water bottle. Right. As the train reaches a curve, it goes like this, and then it follows it, so that you don't have to deal with, you know, trying to get around curves and it right. railing. So that's where these come in. Again, we're missing the drivers, and as Sam mentioned. The, uh, I think in that second firebox, you can see where they just cut the piston. This right here, yeah. that's the connecting of the piston rod right there. One of our challenges was this right here slides back and forth, and to oil it, we had to create some oilers to keep it oiled up. And the biggest thing was scraping the rust and stuff. I mean, we worked on this thing for two years to get all the rust scraped off and lubricated. Just to get it moved? Just so we can move it. We move it six inches, and then it would, and then yeah. bring it some more, move it six inches, and the F7 kept doing it. Now right here, Bob was talking about it being articulated. If you look right here, see it's kind of a hole. This whole big thing right here is the hinge pin. Oh, okay. So this is this begins all the way to the front, the front half of the plane of the train that's articulated, and that's the big pin that holds the front half and the back half together. Because basically, before the big boy came along, they would do a steam locomotive on flat land, and if they had to go over the Rocky Mountains, they'd have to put another locomotive in front of it, paying another train crew, taking the time to hook it all up and run it up over the mountains. So this gives them two trains, two locomotives, under one, with one wow, crew. That's cool. And they can just blow right on through. Now the weight of this thing is so much that it's been sitting here since the, uh, uh, August of 13. Right. It's beginning to spread the rails so you know we need to in, in the near future get this moved how away. far do you move it like since i mean like we're talking about like maybe six or eight feet or, or well, you it have hasn't to move moved it. since we brought it in here yeah, no i'm right. talking about since the rails are starting to well it's been two years and it how far would you have to how much you i don't know how far but i guess they'd have to get it onto another side yeah another track. yeah so the length of the locomotive at least yeah. so that you were on you know Now, I spoke about the colors. Here's the Santa Fe locomotive next in the freight colors, the blue and yellow. Let me get a front shot of the big boy real quick. One of the, one of the cool things going on right now, you notice this is the 4018 big boy? Right. There were 25 of them built, numbered 4000 to uh -huh. 4024. And Union Pacific has gotten back the 4014 from California, and their intention is to restore it to full operation. And oh, they're restoring it right now? Mm -hmm. yes. Right now it's in Where is Cheyenne. it at? It's in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Union Pacific oh, Steam cool. Shop is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So there is another, like, but they don't call so Big Boy? Well, yeah. there are eight of them. There are eight Big Boys. They still, still call, exist. okay. Yep, and there are eight Big Boys. They just boy. have different numbers. Right. So this is 4018 Big Boy. Right. If yeah. you want to be specific, it's, and then the other one is, it has it's got the 4014. Some, wow. And none of them are operational at this point. None of them have run probably since the right. 50s. But they're going to restore the 4014, and within two years it'll be like the Challenger, and and right. it, it'll be it'll be able to run on excursions. So Will this ever be restored to? to probably not. Probably it would not. cost millions to restore it. Yeah. Uh, because you'd have to go in and basically you have to take the boiler apart and take everything out and yeah. restore that. That that's just very you know cost prohibitive. Well, that's why they that's why they ditch steam engines in the first place. That. The typical thinking is that a steam engine requires about 15 maintenance people all the time to keep it running. Right. It has to be always lubricated, refueled, rewatered every 100 miles or so. Diesel electric can be maintained by about three people, and it runs a lot further on a tank of fuel, and it's only burning up fuel, not coal and water. Right. And it's putting, you know, I don't know if you've seen any of the videos of the big boys running. I s but they oh, some like of the, some water. older footage, you mean? Right, yeah, well, if you go online, do a, do a uh, YouTube search for uh, Union Pacific Big Boy. Okay. They've got several videos on there showing them in action. And okay. then they are laying out the smoke. Uh, also, at the second floor of the Heritage Museum, there is a video of this move. So okay. even though it won't be steaming under its own power, you'll see some of we'll the We'll take activities. a look at that, yeah. Uh, you can see the locomotives and the tank cars and everything and understand you know, why Now, this there. locomotive looks like it's been sandblasted in the sense it was. It worked at a cement plant, so there was right. a lot of grit and dust, and so it really wore the, the paint down and made it all dull. But these were originally Santa Fe 
uh, locomotives that were, uh, again, donated to TXI. The white one at the far end of the track is also the same from the same thing, but that one, for whatever reason, they painted white and took it out of the normal colors. Oh, okay. But you can just see all the grit that's on the wheel frame that's kind of just caked on there from... So the reason why it looks faded, you're saying they spray blasted it kind of well, like Well, because it, it worked, right? no. When oh, okay. it worked, there was just all this particulate in the air that oh, kind of okay. naturally. Cement dust in the air and it just coated it with cement dust. You oh, see, okay. It's got a little TXI sticker on it. It actually came from TXI. Oh, yeah. yeah. I tell you, it just, we like, just, these are really recent uh, uh, additions since last, since last year's summer. This one and the white one, that's really a, a mate to this one, but it was just painted in a, in a white uh, a paint color. Oh, okay. And this one, I believe, will run too. I have to say we got some more extension cards. Uh, so that at some point, we may use this as, as to power up and move some of the... Um, some of the equipment. The main BNSF line. Okay, so out, way out there goes out to the main right. tracks. Well, the, to train, get the... the train came in on the, you stand up here, you can see that there's two tracks. Oh, okay. Here. The big boy came in, all the stuff right. came in on the track on this side. And then up here, the two merged, and there's a switch, or was, it's, the switch has been pulled out okay. now, but there, there was a switch, and we could back everything back. Oh, there. okay. Some of the hand tracks service at some point, and those are the added to the collection also. Okay. So we're coming up on Big Boy right now. There must be some snow up here in Melvin. I'm watching the water drip. Hey, we're looking at Big Boy here. 